morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the discussion that uh, Katka Atrichová already introduced. We will be discussing um, the question of uh, Europe on a global stage. The topic is towards a new Europe, European leadership and autonomy among global upheaval. Um, power politics is on the rise worldwide. We see a rising superpower and a number of uh, middle powers that are all um, acting uh, more assertive. If Europe wants uh, to protect its uh, interests and its values in this uh, quickly changing world, then it needs also to act and to talk more united than it's used to. The question is how to achieve that. And I'm glad and I'm honored that uh, we will have uh, the chance to discuss uh, this question with uh, Federica Mogherini. Um, Federica Mogherini is uh, currently the rector at the College of uh, Europe and previously she was uh, the high representative of the European Union for foreign affairs and security policy. Uh, Federica, good morning. Good morning. I hope you hear me and see me. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank you uh, personally, but also the organizers uh, uh, for uh, doing this uh, in this uh, very important time, as previous speakers have uh, pointed out, uh, and also for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. The only regret is uh, not being able to be uh, present physically in Prague, uh, but uh, it is a pleasure uh, to join you at least uh, uh, remotely, virtually, uh, and looking forward to be in Prague again very soon uh, and uh, continue our work together in presence. Thank you once again also for making time and maybe one of the next years here uh, we'll see in person. But um, let me ask you the first question. Basically, the presidency of Donald Trump um, and, and its approach of America first uh, clearly increased the pressure on Europe um, to be a more robust, uh, more united actor on the international stage. Um, how exactly did our continent move forward in this respect in the previous four years? And also, is there a region or a policy field that you would uh, showcase as a, as a good example of um, how a stronger European role on the international stage could uh, look like? Yes, well, uh, the last four years have been uh, a test, uh, also an opportunity, I think, for, for the European Union uh, to increase, uh, well, first to question and then to increase, I think, uh, its autonomy and leadership. Both of them were much more needed during the last four years than ever before for the combination of uh, multiple crises, uh, uh, constantly growing challenges uh, to security, to stability around us, but also far away globally. Uh, with uh, the big, big uh, uh, threat of uh, climate change, uh, but also wars and conflicts and proliferation uh, that uh, poses questions and, and threats to Europe, first of all. Um, and for the first time, the European Union has uh, faced uh, the need to uh, act uh, uh, possibly alone uh, if uh, the US administration was not uh, on the same policy lines or priorities that the European Union was, uh, was having. This has been the case and um, yes, I can probably indicate a couple of issues on which uh, the European Union in the last uh, uh, few years has shown uh, uh, consistency, leadership and autonomy. Uh, one is for sure the work that it has, done, has been done to preserve uh, the nuclear deal with Iran. The moment when the Trump administration decided to step out of it uh, or stop respecting it, uh, because uh, I always pointed out it's a UN Security Council resolution, it's not a bilateral or, or multilateral agreement. Uh, when the Trump administration decided to step out, uh, the European Union and all the member states, uh, nobody excluded, um, kept uh, the point, uh, kept uh, uh, the relations and the work with other world powers and, and partners, uh, starting from Russia and China, but also the others, and managed to uh, keep a channel open and managed to preserve largely uh, the nuclear uh, agreement. And so this allows now probably the next administration to reflect on how to rejoin or how to revitalize that, that kind of work. And the second field uh, that comes to my mind is the work we've done on security. Um, by the way, it started uh, during the Slovak presidency, so next door to Prague. Uh, and. Uh, uh, 
uh, work that uh, uh, has been done uh, uh, not in response to uh, the US shift, but uh, uh, in, in parallel times somehow, uh, 16, uh, 17. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a work, and it is still a work, that I think is essential for the European Union to show leadership and autonomy in times where we definitely need to do more on the European side on our own security and defence. What we've also been witnessing um, in the neighbourhood of uh, Europe for a number of conflicts, um, Libya, recently Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, now there is a new one, a dangerous one, erupting in Ethiopia. And to a bystander, it often looks like, unfortunately, that uh, Europe is rather, uh, rather passive, uh, rather observing um, than acting. Uh, I wonder uh, what are, in your opinions, obstacles to a more robust European role in those conflicts? Um, how would, and on the other hand, how would a more active leadership, a more robust leadership, concretely look like? You can pick one of those conflicts. Well, well, I think that, uh, um, well, this is something that we constantly refer to, the fact that the European Union uh, sometimes is not able to uh, solve conflicts. Uh, I wonder who is able to solve these conflicts, because it's not just the European Union that is not uh, uh, managing to put an end to these conflicts that are very painful and long-lasting, some of them uh, very close to us. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, I think, a sense of frustration that the European Union shares also with uh, uh, other world powers, not to mention the United Nations, that itself is struggling to find a mediation path out of uh, uh, this kind of conflicts and crisis. Why? Because these conflicts and crises are so multi-layered that you have to be able to move different uh, uh, levels uh, to, um, to try to find the right combination of interests that can lead to a solution of the conflict. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say that there is even one single conflict in the world where one world power only has all the leverages that are needed to solve the conflicts. You need to put together different interests uh, from the United States to sometimes Russia or uh, um, other regional powers. I think of the role of Turkey or the Gulf countries in the case of the Libyan uh, war uh, or regional organizations. So. The European Union can do so much, but cannot do everything alone. And uh, uh, in some cases, I would say in most cases, the role of the European Union has been vital in preserving uh, a possibility for better times to bring a solution uh, at the negotiating table. Um, I would say the image I have in my mind is, is the European Union keeping the door open for, um, for opening it completely for negotiations and mediations when the time will be right, and in particular when uh, we will have a US administration that would engage in peace negotiations and processes actively. Uh, I don't think that the European Union alone can solve problems so complicated and so complex uh, as, as the ones that are surrounding us. But imagine what this conflict will be without the European Union presence, without the European Union engagement on the ground, diplomatically, from a humanitarian point of view, from a development point of view, from a mediation point of view. If you took away all the work of the European Union on the ground, uh, you would have a situation that would be not 100, but 1,000 times worse than it is today. So I understand this is a little, um, little um, thing. It can seem a little thing, but it's literally saving lives on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's the European Union that is not acting. I would say that it's the world that is definitely going in the wrong direction. And, the European Union for what it can do, and it is a lot, would never be sufficient alone uh, to find uh, uh, the right solutions to all the crises that are around us. We need others to mobilize, at least as much as the European Union is doing. Mm -hmm. But still to follow up, if the EU would be more robust and more united, what would be differently different than it is now? How would you imagine it? Well, more robust, uh, more united. Uh, I don't think we have a problem of unity. Uh, I, um, I know uh, you always hear that uh, the, the European Union is not united. I can say, I used to say this uh, when I was in office, and I'm still saying this, I don't think the European Union is not united on foreign policy. Actually, I think it's more united than it is on many domestic files. Um, it's, it's difficult uh, uh, to find uh, one single file on foreign policy where the European Union member states don't share a common vision and a common uh, 
perspective and, and purpose, uh, and also where they don't act together. Um, the strength of the European Union, uh, this is a difficult question because uh, the real question is what does it mean being more effective in conflict uh, management and crisis resolution in the world of today? Is it military power? Um, not really or not alone. Uh, for sure, the European Union has to and is strengthening uh, its uh, military uh, capabilities and capacity to act. Uh, but this is not the key to solving conflicts uh, today. It's not the only one. Uh, is it diplomatic, economic power and pressure? For sure. But again, my sense is that the real trigger wherever you find solutions uh, to conflicts uh, or crisis, the real trigger is the combination in a multilateral setup of different elements that can incentivize a peace agreement uh, or a solution of a conflict. And in, for this, you need, by default, several actors around the table. I don't think that neither the European Union nor anybody else in the world, no matter how powerful they are, can alone solve one conflict or one crisis. So yes, the, the more we get stronger, the better it is for the world, for us, for our neighborhood. Uh, but uh, I don't think the European Union nor anybody else uh, should ever go alone uh, on, on solving a crisis. I think the added value uh, and the real solution uh, to crisis and conflicts uh, is acting together. Let me move to one macro topic that is about to shape the world in the coming years and maybe decades, and that's the growing uh, geopolitical rivalry between the United States and China. I was wondering, where are you seeing the place and the role of Europe in this struggle? Yes, we had uh, difficult years um, behind. We have difficult years behind us. Uh, years where the European Union find itself, found itself uh, um, in the difficult position of uh, not agreeing uh, with China on many policies and files. Um, still agreeing on some. Uh, I, I would like to remind us all that the European Union still defines China um, in a multiple way. Uh, China is for the European Union still a partner on some files. I mentioned before the nuclear deal with Iran uh, without China uh, and also Russia, uh, we wouldn't have managed to preserve it uh, till today. Um, but also uh, the European Union defines China as a competitor when it comes to economic issues and even a rival. And there is no mystery that China and the European Union have different uh, political systems, have different values, and have some issues on which we profoundly disagree. Um, and there's no mystery. We, we talk candidly about that. Um, I think of human rights, I think of respect of minorities, and so on and so forth. Um, but the difficulty in these past years was that, uh, um, especially when facing the economic challenges and, and competition coming from China, I think of uh, um, the, um, uh, the very limited, if not existent, access to uh, the Chinese markets. I think of uh, uh, the steel overproduction, crisis of this kind. Where, while we were used to uh, work together and in partnership with our friends across the Atlantic to try and address these issues together, we found uh, an American administration that was on a different page very confrontational towards Beijing, which is not necessarily the position of the European Union, but also not ready to work with the European Union to address issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. This has uh, um, given the European Union, I think, a, a space uh, for developing an autonomous uh, position uh, towards China that I think that today can be of inspiration for the new US administration. Um, China is not an enemy, uh, but it's not uh, even uh, just a partner. Uh, it's a complex uh, interlocutor uh, with whom you need to find different levels of uh, cooperation or confrontation, um, depending on the file you address. And this complexity of the relationship, I think, is something that uh, Europe has. Um, it is not by coincidence, I think, that in the most recent times, uh, relations have grown better um, compared to maybe three or four years ago, where we had uh, quite in a crisis mode. Um, but uh, I think that now the US administration, the new, well, the incoming one, uh, will, uh, um, will possibly look at the European uh, approach to China as a source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. 
And that brings me to, let's say, the last question from my side before I maybe pick up one uh, from the online audience. And that concerns uh, the new US administration, because we could see quite a relief uh, in European capitals, uh, that in most of European capitals, that uh, uh, Joe Biden was elected. But nobody can be sure what will happen in 2024, if not another voice of uh, America first will be elected into the White House. We don't know. So my question is uh, basically, how should we as Europeans use the presidency of uh, Europe-friendly, classical, transatlantic politician like Joe Biden? Which uh, steps or ideas should uh, we, as Euro European Union, really push forward um, uh, to cooperate with the states? Well, as I said, uh, I think that this last uh, four years of the Trump administration have uh, uh, given uh, us Europeans, uh, uh, yeah, uh, put us in front of some challenges, to put it uh, diplomatically, but have also given us the opportunity to grow up. I put it this way. We have realized that uh, we are grown-ups, uh, we're not kids anymore. Uh, if ever Europe uh, can be considered as uh, the younger brother or sister of the United States, uh, historically it's rather the contrary, but politically and economically and, and uh, from a security point of view, we always perceived ourselves in Europe as uh, uh, the younger, the, the junior partner of this alliance, uh, probably in, with a wrong perception, but this has been the perception over the last decades. I think that this last four has made us realize that uh, uh, we uh, we are grown-ups we can stand on our own feet we don't like it we prefer to work in partnership uh, especially with the united states that are our natural partner i would say brothers and sisters literally family um, in, in Prague as well as in, in Rome or uh, in, in Dublin or wherever. Uh, there's so many uh, Americans that are also our own uh, citizens or relatives. Um, so the, the ties are so strong uh, also because our people are tied together. But uh, uh, in this last four years, we realized that uh, uh, we have the capacity to act autonomously and with some leadership. Uh, as Europeans. Again, it's not our preferred option, but we are able to do it if needed and whenever it's needed. And I think it will be essential for us Europeans to preserve this uh, awareness, uh, to protect and, and develop even more uh, this capacity we have to uh, focus on our own interests, check uh, on a, a very realistic and pragmatic uh, um, uh, approach, uh, in which cases these interests uh, coincide uh, and go together with the American ones, uh, which are the fights we can fight together, which are uh, the campaigns or the works uh, that we can do, uh, especially diplomatically, I think, and in the UN system, together with the new US administration. But I think we should preserve this capacity we have developed to, uh, to, to be autonomous and to be, uh, to be able to lead uh, if needed. I think of the, yeah, of the times where the European, uh, Europeans stayed uh, in, in the Climate uh, Paris Agreement, literally saving it. Uh, all the work we've done to literally save some of the UN agencies um, uh, challenged by uh, the US, uh, um, either lack of interest or active obstruction. Um, I think we should keep the memory of that work and, uh, and preserve it. Not because uh, it's good to get ready for another difficult time. Who knows what will happen in four years? Sure, but uh, who knows what will happen in, in, in six months? I mean, we don't even know uh, if we will be able to travel in, in few months. Uh, so difficult to predict uh, four years from now. For sure, uh, the democratic uh, side on, uh, uh, on the US uh, uh, political landscape will uh, uh, start planning uh, uh, quite soon for the next uh, uh, presidential campaign. Uh, I guess that also on the Republican side, some lessons will be learned uh, and probably we'll have a more uh, traditional approach also on that side. But this is, this is to our American friends to define and, and, and discuss in the coming months and years. But in any case, I think it would be good for Europe and for the world if Europe uh, manages now in this coming four years to consolidate uh, its, um, I would say, its, um, its autonomy, uh, which doesn't mean, uh, let me stress it once again, going against the United States or going without the United States if there is the chance of going together. Every time there is a chance to work together, we work together. And we've done that even during the Trump administration on many files. But in case this would not be possible, I think we should keep our uh, capacity to do it. Thank you, Federica. 
I wonder we have only one minute left, so I will maybe pick you one question from the audience, which is also complicated, but maybe ask you just for a brief, uh, brief answer on that. And that question concerns Turkey. Which approach should the EU uh, present towards Turkey regarding um, its involvement in foreign conflicts uh, in the Caucasus, for example? And I have one minute for that. <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> That's, a challenge, That's a more challenging than all the rest. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, the European Union relationship with China is complex. Uh, probably the one with Turkey is even more complex because it's at the same time uh, uh, a neighboring country, uh, a partner, um, a player in some of the regional conflicts, as you mentioned, uh, but also, uh, well, a player in some of the regional conflicts that affect uh, uh, member states. I think of. Uh, uh, the Cyprus issue, I think, of uh, um, some uh, uh, evident tensions with Greece. Uh, it's also a NATO ally, ally um, and uh, uh, it's uh, a partner uh, and uh, uh, a European country uh, that has internal challenges when it comes to human rights and, uh, and the rule of law, which are not uh, insignificant elements uh, in uh, defining our partnership uh, with such a close uh, um, with such a close country. Um, I think the European Union should do what it should do with all partners in the world, um, merit-based, um, be candid and, and straightforward uh, on uh, uh, the things that uh, uh, the European Union and its member states believe and think are not right, uh, without losing sight of uh, the positive partnership that still uh, can be developed. Uh, I think, for instance, of the humanitarian work that we've done together with Turkey on the Syrian refugees, which is precious. Um, so I would say that the approach should be a differentiated one, being very adamant and clear and tough uh, on the files on which uh, we have clear disagreements, uh, being transparent on that, but not forgetting uh, that uh, Turkey can also represent a partner on some other uh, files and issues. Uh, and trying to keep uh, uh, separate approaches on separate files. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is the only way uh, forward. Uh, obviously, this requires also a similar approach on the Turkish side, um, respect uh, and dialogue. Uh, I think these are the two key words uh, yeah. in our difficult uh, relationship. Difficult, but vital. Thanks a lot, uh, Federica. Thanks a lot for uh, your inspiring, interesting answers. Thanks a lot uh, that you took time for our morning discussions. Uh, I wish you stay healthy and maybe see you here in Prague uh, in person in one of the future, future uh, uh, hopefully, years. Hopefully very soon. Thank you very much for hosting me and I wish uh, all the participants uh, uh, very interesting uh, discussions uh, at the Prague European Summit. Thank you very much and I wish I could be there uh, next year uh, for the 2021 edition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Uh, děkuji vám. Um, uh, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this uh, discussion on an issue that uh, I personally believe uh, we should, uh, as Europeans, be discussing uh, constantly. And um, I wish you uh, fruitful uh, discussions uh, during the rest of the day and uh, give uh, back uh, the word to Katka Etrichová. Goodbye.